Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Amit Him, the Holy One, the Fully Enlightened One, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. One of these days, I'll get the translation on that. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see. We have, this is forever. Okay. So um, I've read, I have one to read something to you I found that's really interesting. And this is kind of about tonight because what we're doing is another, we're going to keep going with the foundation pieces. And so what we're looking at right now is examining the six uh, links that are on your practice sheet one by one. So what we've done so far is we've looked at context. We've looked at feeling. We've looked at craving. We've looked at clinging. Now we're gonna look at the bawa link. And um, this was kind of interesting. This, is, this comes from Majima Nikai number seven, in section 17. I'm not sure if I have to go to the note or not, but uh, it's uh, here. He understands there is this, there is the inferior and there is the superior. Um, and um, I guess I have to read, yeah, I'll do it this way. He understands thus, there is, there is this, there is the inferior, there is the superior. And beyond there is an escape from this whole field of perception. And when he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sexual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. And when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, and there is no more coming to any state of being. And this is called one who is bathed with the inner bathing. Now, there's a note, and it's really cool. And also, when you go back to the way that we translate, if you listen to this, I'm doing it the way that we translate a couple pieces, you'll hear it. Listen to it again. There is this, the truth of this suffering. There is the inferior, the origin of the suffering. There is the superior, the truth of a path. And there is an escape from this whole field of perception, which is Nibbana, leading to the total cessation of suffering. Now, when he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire and from the taint of being which we say is trapped by habitual reactions. They all completely have stopped and moved the person has shift over to a state of responding and starting to live more with responses. And when the, from the taint of ignorance, and you know that we talk about that as not understanding the Four Noble Truths, not understanding dependent origination, not understanding the three characteristics and the connectivity between the three parts, the three groups. And from the taint of uh, ignorance, okay, and then from when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands birth of reactions and are completely destroyed. And the holy life has been lived and what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. And being is the existence. We talk about the being as the existence, individual lifetimes existence. And then you have the experience that you're going through and you're experiencing through the six sense doors and everything that we talk about. And this one, the one who goes all the way through to the end of any state of being of existences, this one is bathed with an inner bathing. And he was speaking to someone who believed in an outer bathing in a discussion with another group when he was talking about this. He was trying to, the Buddha was trying to explain his point of view. 
I really like the link of the uh, BAWA link. And I'm going to go to the paper first, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. Because if you look at it from our perspective, the way that we look at what it means, remember first that you have people coming to learn meditation from many, many different reasons. And some of it's directly health reasons as a modality to relieve stress and give the person more help with relaxation if they're in depression or suffering from grief like that. And then you have the people who come and they use it instead of a, in certain kinds you can come to go to someone instead of the calisthenics we did to relax our bodies and body meditations of relaxing all the way from the toes to the head where they talk to you about this. Some people come to meditation just to get relaxed and be able to go out and not be tense at all in their bodies. Okay, then you have the lay person in Buddhism. The lay person in Buddhism, um, some people who are not really, in, they're really wrapped up in the, uh, some countries are really wrapped up in met in the merit system and wanting to do that and do that part of the Buddhism. This is why I'm telling you what you're really studying is you're studying Buddha Dhamma. We're not talking about Buddhism because the, all of these different variations, a person can say, I'm a Buddhist, okay, but Buddhist in the sense of Buddhism. And then there are people who want to get close into understanding the Buddha Dhamma. And it was interesting. I was in Sri Lanka, I believe it was um, 2015, when I was at the university and they were marking the papers for the for the master's thesis, uh, they were getting extra points that year. All of a sudden, if they were separating, when they, when they made discussions in their theses, their treatises, they were getting extra points if they pointed this out, when I'm talking to you. In the Buddhist studies department, they want you to make a def definition, a, a definitive line between Buddhism and Buddha Dhamma. And so it's beginning to take hold. And that's an upward step in the swing of things. Because if they do that, they're saying, you need to really go back to what the Buddha said and what he exactly taught is the Buddha Dhamma, the teaching of the Buddha. Okay, the Buddhism, you go and look up ism and find out where the religion go, you know, and how that all works. And when you take an ism, it's very different from just the Buddha Dhamma. Okay, so when we're coming to it, we're, we're really fundamentalists. I, I, that's what I equate us to hear about what happened within Christianity between the, Buddha, the uh, Baptist church was interesting because they split into three groups, Southern Baptist, Baptist, and fundamentalist. And so <laughs> and it's really interesting how they did that because the ones that were really, really taking the Bible and really using it baseline, what did uh, the G Jesus say in the red letter version of the Bible and going from that angle to study in a way that's what we're doing we didn't exactly plan it that way but actually this is what's happened because uh, I was listening this week to a few monks who were doing talks and I was noticing that they don't quote very much where they're getting stuff from and the male monks are a sort of, it's a privilege that they don't really have to. People will take it as the word if whether they quote where it's coming from or not. And in my case, I don't mean to be obnoxious with it, but I went through about three years at the center where I was in charge of the people online and working with people from all over the world. And there were a lot of conflicts as, and who said that, where is that from? And they would never do that to uh, a, a monk, whether he was a, a new monk or an older monk, but they certainly will do it to a woman. And the best thing for me to do was to try to get as much as you can understand where you're pulling things from if you start to talk about what we're doing. And the reason is you're not trying to be a know-it-all. You're trying to say, I want you to understand this is not me saying this is coming trying to get across to you exactly what was going on and what it really meant when we're showing you where things are coming from in the texts. 
And the reason is because our approach is all hooked together with how a practice actually works well enough for you to take it into life. And so we want you to be able to carry it into life and use it all the time. So if we look at this, he, he, this, this statement at, that he was trying to get across to the other group in this, he's really talking about the habitual tendencies, being trapped by the habitual tendencies. If we look at that way, it means a lot to the lay person. And there's, there is a line. This week I had three calls and a couple of people writing me about if I teach somebody about the, um, about the Buddhist teaching, should I tell them not to smile? I couldn't understand that, but nobody is connecting the science of smiling and the uplifting lightness of the mind and how much clearer it is if there's no pressure on it, you see? But we're trying to show you if we want you to develop your meditation and we want you to comprehend the Dhamma on a parallel line so that you're balanced in your understanding and your practice that we really believe you can get down the path and really make ground. And that's what's happened. You know, that's, we've seen enough of this happening that way that it's important that to us that when we talk to you about something, if it isn't clearly connected, easily connected in your mind to the practice, come back to me counter me, question me, uh, because that's how I learn. That's my training ground. In the beginning, there was no class for me. The reason that the online group was originally formed at Damasuka was so I could have a classroom. <laughs> because I thought when Bonte taught me meditation, I could just go out and talk to anybody about what I learned. I was so excited. And then I ran, I ran aground because I didn't know they were doing something completely different. And I came back and said, but I want to be able to be challenged and uh, sort of feel like there's not that, well, feel the support of other people in a classroom who are all digging for the same thing and want the answers. So I was encouraged to dig. It's what made me read the Dhamma, the, the uh, the uh, Majima Nikaya the first time. It's what made me go and get the Upanisha Sutta and made me read the other books that Bhante gave me and willingly because I was getting answers from people. So I didn't have a class per se. I had your questions and I went to him and if he wouldn't give me the answer, he would give me something to find the answer and give it to you. And that was my training system. His system, Bonte V. Miller Ramsey, had the, an experience, a unique experience in Asia. He was privy to getting the tail end, the very tail end of many of the masters that he could visit before they passed away. He was lucky. He got, he was, a, the, the simpatico between Bonte and I is um, the statement, um, excuse me, can I ask a question? <laughs> He told me if I died, he was going to have a tombstone made with my finger up saying, may I ask a question? <laughs> I, can you put, may I please ask a question? You have to understand, I drove him as the driver in a, in a truck. I drove him across America twice. Once was 18,600 miles and the last time 16,800 miles. Multiply it out and figure out your kilometers. It's 2.5 times that number. So what did I do? You know, I let him eat lunch and take a nap over here, uh, three feet, about three feet away from me in this, this big, you know, truck we were driving stuff. And, um, but then as soon as he woke up, I had a question. <laughs> you know, I was allowed to rest for half an hour after lunch and he would take a walk and then he would sit outside. Then we would start driving again. And uh, this, this went on for three years. I was driving an awful lot. And that's how I memorized the Chichaka Sutta. We did it in the truck together, you see? We got it out and we did it twice in the morning, twice in the afternoon. We did it section by section as we're driving. Six and a half hours a day, seven hours a day driving with a break for lunch, a small rest and stopping by dusk. We never ever drove at night, never. So it was a really interesting time for me because I don't know how this happened in the universe. I end up with like a master meditation teacher in a truck for 18,000 miles. <laughs> 
But all of a sudden you can ask him and then that question leads to another, leads to another, leads to another and all these different topics discussed. And plus you're not allowed to eat breakfast unless you sat in the morning, got up and sat early in the morning. And then you, when we pull in someplace, I have to get a room for him, check the room, let him have his room, go to the other end of the motel, get another room <laughs> and then go there and then sit there and then go to sleep. So constantly this was going on. It was an odd routine. It was almost two years before he admitted to me, you were my guinea pig. <laughs> I said, you guinea pig. You were like my lab rat. I wanted to know if uh, an American could be taught completely in English without the assistance of Polly initially, the Buddha Dhamma. And could they learn to meditate and make, uh, you know, progress down the path and would they ask questions well obviously i made him understand i would ask questions okay so that's what happened so let's go in i think we've got pretty much everybody here we usually wait for about 20 people so we're going to go in we're going to start now on this document and um there i blinked it out that was good okay let me try again <laughs> let me see what i do i have to you are screen sharing. How do I do that? Oh, wait a minute. Oh boy. It's probably because I stretched you. I have a habit of working this thing. I didn't know how to get back to you, so I just stretched you and pushed you across my screen. <laughs> there you go, okay. So this is about the habitual tendency link. It is called Bawa. Now remember for just a minute, you should play this game with me. You know, if you have an eye and the working eye and you see something with the eye, you have to have the eye, you have to have the color and form that the eye sees, meets. And then you have to have eye consciousness come together. And those three pieces, those three pieces are like a little molecule that makes contact happen. With contact as conditioned feeling arises. The feeling is painful or pleasant or neutral. With feeling as condition, then craving arises. Craving is the always manifests as arising tension and tightness in the mind, especially first the mind and the body. So you, you get more and more sensitive. Initially, I've had people who did a lot of one-point concentration and they try this, that just doesn't work. There isn't any tension. What are you talking about? You can't see tension. Well, they can't because their mind is just like that and very tight. So that when this craving arises, they can't notice it. You have to really coax them and get them, let go of that and just relax for a while until you calm, the calmer you get, then when this comes up, you can feel it arising. So that's your, your, your tension and tightness. Uh, it, it's always manifesting as attention and tightness in the mind and the body. With craving as condition, clinging uh, arises. And the clinging is the story about why you like this or you don't like it. In the craving was the other point about it is the first personal opinion. And I'm gonna say obvious personal opinion because there was, you know, we had a discussion about that one time. And yes, the I is existing in the other part too. It's part of the driving force for it all to operate, the Atta, but it isn't obvious. And what the obvious personal opinion that occurs in the line of the human cognition, the first one is this, I don't like this, I, or I, li I like it. And it slips, it goes from, I don't like it, I don't want it, and I'm going to have aversion to it. And then you're gonna struggle to make the aversion stop. That's what happens. Or I like it, I want it, attachment. And you get clinging to it, wanting for, and start living life trying to cling in that direction. This bawa, this bawa is, um, sometimes the Pali word bawa is translated, it, this is the way the history of it worked. It was first said to be being. Well, that was interesting, but none of the meditators got much out of that. They didn't really understand what it meant. So to say, just say being 
was not sufficient. Later on in history, they, they said it meant experience. Well, we see the active life and the active experience going on. You and I know from what we have studied, there is this tension and tightness in there, in that, but we still don't get what it actually is when we compare it to craving and clinging. It is not a distinct link that bothered us, you know? Bonte's teacher in the West, on the West Coast was one of the highest poly teachers with one of the highest awards in the history of Burma. And that was uh, the most venerable Usilananda, deceased now in 2005. We went and had a discussion with him. I was sitting there like the fly on the wall. I could listen. And, and he discussed it with him about this. And basically, uh, he wanted to change the definition. The third one they came up with was closer, closer to what it really meant to us when we are meditators. The third one was becoming. It means becoming. Well, the reason becoming was better was because it had motion in it. It had power, energy, or, or tightness. You know, it, it moved, you see? And this is, you're just about to go into the jati, the birth of the event or the birth of the action or reaction. And so this becoming, it was closer, but they didn't know that because this, the whole idea of what I'm talking about, it wasn't in the commentary translated that way to mean this. And so nobody really got it. But when I saw that, I said, well, we could have lived with becoming. But then Bondi came up with this idea. What this really is, if we examine what happens and we're actually watching the line and watching and watching it all the time, we realize that after we crave and we cling, I like it and I like it because blah, 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 blah. And then I'm going to decide what I'm going to give a birth of action, what that action is going to be as a result of craving and clinging on the feeling that came up, you see? So all of a sudden he said, you know, if I look at what I do every time, it's my habitual tendency or my habitual emotional reaction. It comes from one place and that's where it comes from, that link. So in that link, if we were to look at it, um, if we were to look at it on the board, I don't know if we can do that or not, let you, here we go. If we, no, I'm not gonna do it, okay. You look at it on the board, we say, okay, this is it. And from this spot, like the spot on my finger, um, you know, this is what you could do or that or that or that or that they're all stored in there all these different reactions now what is this reaction how does it work when i say reaction what i'm going to show you tell you about is in craving in your on your chart when we, i gave you the chart in sort of the middle of craving down at the bottom of the chart there's a little pink line and it says emotions 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 with a little pointing piece arrow that's on the bottom of the chart that that's where those emotions are kind of coming up. They're forming there, okay? That's where they start. They're not right happening at craving, but craving and clinging is where they're forming. And now you have to decide what reaction you're gonna have or what action are you going to take in the situation of what you're going through. So to say habitual tendencies is where it is. This is where you sort of reach in that little place, tiny place in your head, and you pull out one little card and it says, smack the person back. If they hit you, smack them back. <laughs> or if somebody yelled at you, say, scream back. This are, these are the things. And the way these operate, how can we explain it to you in modern times? Well, uh, someone said the best way, and I, I think they're right, is if you've ever been to a website and you see where they make the website and they create a loop on in, in the code, they put a loop. So we only have to record something that is this long. But if we turn it into a loop, it will keep playing and playing in a circle, in a circle, in a circle on the PowerPoint or on a little film they do or something they make. They can make these little loops. The old terminology was this is where your recordings are. <laughs> and the tape recorder and the, re the, the recorders, now we say it's you're looping. And the psychologists have changed this too. They used to say, you have a bad habit, Deepa. Don't do that when your mother says that anymore. But she always does that. And we would say to you, 
this is your recording. You have to cancel it. Now we say stop looping. That's what my daughter told me. She's the new psychologist. So, so now they are loops. So this is present with the time. So that's what's happening. And it's for practical, uh, the becoming, but for practical operational reasons, we having to do with our meditation, because that's where we teach from. We call this link habitual tendencies, and you'll hear Bhante say habitual emotional tendencies or emotional reactions. The untrained mind is always going to have reactions, but the Buddha even had actions. He had actions, but they weren't habitual. They were just responses. It was action that happened. So once you've let go of all the push of personalizing this, and you're just going along with the whole thing, when something occurs, you're learning to pause, decide what you're going to do, take an action. Well, definitely the Buddha did that as an arahat. They all did. So um, this is the place where all of your knee-jerk emotional reactions live. I think that's a good word, knee-jerk reactions. And their source is una unanimously always derived from past personal events and experiences in your life. That's where these habitual patterns of behavior come from. It's what you always do if somebody does that to you in line or says something to you or criticizes you or whatever, or asks you to do so much work and you have a reaction or something. And um, I had a little girl in Tampa, Florida with her mother having a hissy fit. She didn't want to clean up the house. She had, after going to the temple, made arrangements with her friends to go buy shoes at the mall. So the mother and her were having a big fight on the patio and I came out on the patio and I started laughing. And they said, what are you laughing? I said, take a seat. <laughs> and I explained to them, you know, what is this? You know, this is Buddhist family. And they just watched me. And I said, this Buddhist family, mom wants you to clean the room. Why? She said, because grandma's coming over to the house. And she said, we have to clean my room. But I don't want to clean my room because I want to go with my, so how long does it take to clean your room? Maybe 15 minutes. So you can't clean your room and then go. You could even negotiate with your mom. I'll clean the room if you'll help me for five minutes. And then I'll help you in the kitchen for five minutes to clean up. And then I can go and you can have grandma over. And th they never thought of that. They just went at each other with these two habitual tendencies. I could watch them through the glass from inside the temple. And then I went out and I just cracked up. I said to myself, what would happen if I suggested a negotiation? After last night's political debate, I thought I should have suggested a negotiation or a compromise between Biden and the president. It was the stupidest thing I ever saw on the face of the earth. And any child that ever thought they wanted to go in government after watching that debate last night would run away and say, please, I want to be a scientist. I want to be a doctor. Don't ever tell me I should be the president or I should go to the United States. It was the most ridiculous. Anyway, <laughs> are you ready to continue? Okay. And, uh, and Q says, yes, I am. I think I am. Can I ask a question? Oh, sure, Q. Okay. So Q is asking the questions here. What is the habitual tendency link? This is the tiny library in your head, just like I said, which holds the source of all the knee-jerk personal reactions for the uh, an untrained mind would act out. That's important. All people suffer from this when they are, are without knowledge of what this link actually is and how it works. Anybody who doesn't have any knowledge about this is just going to keep looping. I love that. Loop, loop, loop. <laughs> it's like a little, little bird call. Loop, 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 loop. <laughs> You're going round and round. Right, the existence of the Bawa link is explains, it explains the source of your reactions. The purpose of the link doesn't seem like much at first, but it certainly does exist. Knee-jerk reactions are repeated actions without realization and how or why they happen. Doesn't it happen so fast? It's like, whoop, that's what I'm gonna do. Whoop, that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, so you can pinpoint your own routine reactions and prove this is the case by keeping a journal of your behavior with people for a week or two. This is really true. So then you review it at the end of a week or so. Don't look at it, just keep writing in it for a week. And then um, at the end, you sit and read it 
with a highlighter <laughs> and you're going to find these things that you do that are automatic and you won't believe me how they're just exactly the same reaction, but you'll find out. And then you review it and it points out the repetition of your behavior patterns. So this link serves as a storage facility. And it's where the records of past emotional habits live or in past emotional experiences, how you handle things. And this is the place that our negative and positive reactive emotions are stored. The, the healthy ones are in there too. Um, they'll come out, but they're not gonna jump out and go wham, you know, really fast, not always. Although there was a good one on the internet. There was a guy uh, riding a motorcycle. I don't know if any of you saw this, but it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the guy's just riding his motorcycle home and this woman had a baby in a walker and the walker was in front of this building, a storage facility, and it was on a hill. And then there was a drainage system down a, that went down into a river. And the baby started walking away when she was in the storage thing on the walker towards the drain. And he was going to get killed. And the guy jumps off his motorcycle, lets the motorcycle go down, grab, catches the baby just before he goes down the really steep part and picks it up and gives it to the mother, starts screaming and she, he gives it to the, to the woman. But he had the presence of mind to get off the motorcycle, go over and get the baby before it went down. He saw it when he was riding up the hill, he saw the thing rolling toward, baby just happy as a lark, you know, in the walker and doesn't know what's coming. And there's a big steep hill taking him down in the drainage thing. Whew, what, uh, what a mind. He says to be a hero. I don't know what will happen to him, but it just was viral. This morning it woke me up. I don't know. I have all kinds of things on my phone. Oh my. <laughs> and it just was there this morning. But have you heard some, ever heard someone say to you, why do you always say that? Why do you always do the same thing over and over again whenever we talk about this or that? Have you ever been in a relationship like that? Most people have been there somewhere. You know, they've run into it. Maybe not with your parents, maybe with friends, maybe at camp, maybe at work. Well, Q says, well, yeah. Don't we all have something like that with our family relationships growing up? We do, all of us probably do have something like that. And the having habits is not unique. There's nothing wrong with these patterns. Most of them are happening because people don't have any knowledge about what we're talking about. All human beings have patterns of emotional behavior and some of the habits are wholesome and they can help you in life. But others that come up really fast like that, you know, are unwholesome and can cause the suffering. And if we look closely at this habitual tendency link, it's like our secret personal library of emotional tendencies. And it's based on our past experience in life. And some of these tendencies may be trickling down from a previous life too. They are, those ones are the fruit of the past actions. You can say Kamapala means the, the, the fruit of the actions. And the, that can be something like all of a sudden, not in your whole life when you were a child, but all of a sudden at 50 or 51, Somebody says, could you go up on the roof and clean out the rain gutters? And you go up on the roof, but you can't stand up and you're scared to death and you don't know why. You were never scared of heights before, but it, all of a sudden this happens. That was a residual kamapala in the state of someone at the center who was going to clean the roof and, and then got stuck and had to come down and was just gray and soaking wet and everything. Couldn't understand it. Growing up, happy to climb a 30 foot tree, happy to go 50 feet up a pine tree and build a platform, no problem. And then all of a sudden this happens and it came from memories from three or four different past lives. So what she had to do in that situation was to go play back the li lifetimes and see if there was anything related to that and turns up like three or four lifetimes where the woman dies by falling off a roof, off a wall, into the crevice in a field, like a rock crevice that's in the middle of a field, 
and off of a cliff and off of a ship uh, from a mast on a ship. And then all of a sudden it hits the person. This has nothing to do with this life. And then guess what happens? As soon as they really believe that and see the difference, it's nothing to do with this life. They're free of it and it's gone overnight. The phobia is gone. There are some books out there right now. If you go to Amazon, there's books about phobias that are, are talking about this regressive type of thing. And you can do, learn how to do this, but we don't do it with many people because we're not interested in creating people who run around saying, oh, I can do this. You know, we're not interested in it. But if somebody had a really bad problem, we might help them with that. These tendencies live in a more or less unconscious corner of your mind. Uh, they can be, uh, become re-stimulated. The re-stimulation is a good word for this. It's re-stimulated means you set off by personal craving and clinging links that happen in the present time actions. Those action, comma means action, okay? That's all a comma means, action. So action in this life, you're building comma every single day by what you do. Be careful because comma comes around and pays you back. So it could be wonderful, but it could be stinky too. It could be not so good. Uh, this link can pop up and appear as our emotional reactions play out during social exchanges. It can happen in the middle of a group of people and it can happen at a dinner party, it can happen anywhere. In other words, we act the way we do based on re-stimulations of previous sense-based contact, feeling, craving, clinging experiences. Past experience dominates the untrained mind. So when you look at people who are really having a lot of problems with this kind of stuff towards you in your group, have a little compassion because sometimes they don't know they're suffering or why the stuff is happening. Sometimes they really don't know. Um, when a similar sight, sound, odor, taste, or a sensation or thought, contact is a similar in a, in a previous, to a previous time, this sets it off. In other words, I, I, I were to go in and just before I fell out of the airplane in my parachute, you know, <laughs> just before they pushed me out of the plane to parachute the first time, I was sitting on a blue thing. And if I remember that I was sitting on the blue thing and I, I see the same blue or the same material, I touch the same material, it could set me off. Now, what we're we talking about here, we are explaining PTSD, post, um, what is it? Post stress, uh, I'm sorry. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We're, we're explaining how it works specifically. And this is exactly how this is described. It can be set off by just a sight, a sound, an odor, a taste, a sensation, meaning touching the, the um, touching a cloth, like a silk piece or something that was a horn, a hem, or what do you say? Um, I forget, horn tooth pattern on it, you know, it's rough wool, feel, you feel it, and just bang, you're back wherever this happened, immediately, and it's very frightening. Or even a thought in a conversation subject that comes up, and you're just with a bunch of people, and all of a sudden this happens, and it can be very scary. But the thought contact is similar to the previous time, and this sets it off. So once re-stimulated in this new interaction, the same emotional reaction takes place and is re-stimulated and happens again and again. So this is where the sixth sense base ties into the links of habitual tendency link. It's the reason they're connected. This is how they're connected. Emotional tendencies can appear to be re routine, uh, routine reactions. They pop up and they're born and replayed again to to present timed occurrences. Most of this um, doesn't even register to us if we do not have proper knowledge. If this is happening in an unconscious way. You could be, um, it can, it's strange when it happens with children. Most times uh, I've talked to some people who work with this stuff in different ways 
it happens for people who are going into teenage years or the middle of their teenage years or their 20s a lot of times okay um it's not necessarily young children that are going to turn this stuff out as easily afterwards uh, we don't even know why we thought something or said something in the way that we did we're, we're shocked too and probably we would deny it uh, it is anything except from this time here and now and after it occurs in retrospect we probably will suffer restlessness guilt and remorse and sloth will we, maybe even cause sloth and torpor because we regret it and we feel badly about it and we blame ourselves but we don't understand the mechanism that's why this stuff is happening so what is the is an example q is asking give me an example well okay i bet you know somebody who has talked with you in your life who might have might have had a girlfriend or a boyfriend break up with them and uh, because they were having problems and you know he says yeah yeah i do okay well perhaps they told you something like this my girl seems to react the same way every time I try to talk to her about certain things. We never get to deciding things because she gets angry and then she doesn't like to sit down and talk at all. And then there doesn't seem to be any reason for this to be happening. And she always runs away from working things out. This is a heavy duty relationship problem. Or, you know, this is something that She's running away because there's a re-stimulation involved in the thing. She's caught in what's called a, a relationship loop. And people can go their whole life and never figure out what this is and end up, I have one person who is suffering because one person is now in their 40s. And nobody wants to marry somebody that's in their 40s. And the person can't do that anymore. And they forgot to stop and get married. And then here they are and they're really stuck. And in this situation, in this culture, that can be a very difficult thing. And so um, this is the re-stimulation of something going on that breaks down the relationship before it can get to a solidified point at all. There's no stability. It's very frustrating. Or maybe you heard that there was a mother and daughter relationship, a problem where every time the young person was asked to clean up their room, this is the one I talked to you about, they acted out in an unreasonable way with an exact same resentment and behavior every single time they tried to talk about cleaning the room. <laughs> and that, that can happen, you know, that I, the one that was in Tampa. And these, these reactions, they play over and over again uh, instead of giving us a space to give a new response, create a new response, simply because we don't know that human cognition exists. It's not included in the health class. It's crazy. It should be connected with the health class. It should happen in high school, but nobody ever tells you about your head. They tell you about everything from year down. For a woman, for a man, broken arms, stomach aches, heartaches, heart problems, circulatory problems, broken legs, uh, you know, all that in, in digestion in your, uh, your digestive tract, all that stuff, but nothing about this. Sometimes your eyes, you get your eyes checked, that's okay. Maybe you had your nose fixed, all right, that's fine. <laughs> but we don't wanna talk about this piece here, like this doesn't exist, we'll just cover the whole thing up and pretend you don't exist, I'm only here. <laughs> that's really, and that's the way it seems to me, really obscure that we refuse to talk about the command center. These reactions, uh, they keep working like that. And let's say that I give, you, um, I give you a report at work and you respond negatively with discussion every time in the same way. It's like a broken record. There are no fresh responses occurring in that situation. No new ideas. This is what happens when you're doing a loop the other person is thinking, oh my gosh, here's the loop again. <laughs> They're not even thinking about working with you and they go, well, no new ideas today. Change is blocked. Nothing innovative can come up. I'm gonna go somewhere else. And they end up not working with you, walking away, going away because you put up a block and you don't even do it intentionally. So these are the behavioral issues around this, this little, Bawa thing, the Bawa link. So now you pause. Okay, I paused. <laughs> Before an action takes place, if we do not understand this link and, we, and let go of it, 
the uh, reaction will become re-stimulated by a reminder that takes place inside this link. It triggers it. You forgot me, you forgot me, I have to react this way. It's like seeing the old memory card and taking action based on what you did before. Well, that's Bawa. You're, you're stuck in Bawa. <laughs> A person has no chance to stop this from happening and change it unless they're taught about the link and they want to change it. So how can I change this uh, from happening? What do I do? Well, by gaining new knowledge about the link, like we're talking about now, you first have to see how it's connected and it's happening for yourself. So if you observe your day-to-day -day actions for a few days, then you begin to notice if there's a particular behavior pattern that keeps coming up. But when, when you read over what you wrote after a few days, you're gonna discover that your fixed actions of thinking, speaking, or physically doing something with the body, you know, things in, in some particular way, you're gonna turn up something when you highlight it at the end of the week. It's because these, reactive patterns that we cannot say we are uh, truly alive in our present time activities. They keep us from working in the present time. First, uh, you have to identify them to let them go. This is just as serious as when we talk about craving coming up and I'm, I'm grabbing onto it. Well, how do you let go of it? You just let go of the attention on it. And then we have to get beyond repeating the speech and actions. We, so we have to almost like hear ourselves and um, it's too bad we don't have, a, what is it called, CTV in our house. <laughs> we play the CTV back every day. We should be able to find it pretty quickly. Although we might appear to be here and now listening, how much are we thinking and analyzing right now about what we're gonna say next? Are we really at home when we're listening? It seems that a lot of us are like this. Our mind stops working and we're trying to live just on automatic. We seem to know we're gonna automatically react. So we find ourselves falling into a funk where everything is a reaction and there just isn't any time where we're actually being creative. And you meet people like this. You can know them in a crowd when you're socializing, you can watch them get stuck. Adults are different in this way from little children. Now this is interesting because children, they don't have a large collection of recordings yet in their head. So when they turn on their curiosity, they can still work with a clear mind. And children don't use up their energy like adults do uh, with this either. Children are still full of bright curiosity and desire for adventure. They seem to have uncrowded open avenues of learning in their minds. And, and that we don't have anymore. And they can offer us what appears to be more like natural creative responses. They, they're wonderful. They're really creative and they're just wonderful. So how do we change this? Well, like we said, knowledge of how this works is the first step in facilitating the change. So you're on, you're on the right track so far. Well, because this link happens so quickly, it's actually a rare case when those involved know to stop, pause, and give themselves some space to see what is essentially going on in the present time situation. We jump into the old ideas, opinions, comparisons, you're in a rut with this, uh, to previous experiences or other such judgments and opinions. And they seem to just sort of flood in. You hear a student say, it's just flooding in, it's coming in, it's, or you hear them come and say to you, you know, I had a sitting and it was like the monsoon was in my head. <laughs> it's just raining, 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 you know, <laughs> all this. And this is why reaction happens so fast because you can't sort it out. And when there's a flood of them, if you don't understand, you were not supposed to stop your brain from thinking. You're supposed to stop giving it personal attention. That's a key piece of this. You let the brain do whatever it's going to do. As you slow down, the brain slows down definitely. And you end up with pausing space where you can consider what to do next. That's what's happening to people that are making progress.
The person gets consumed in what is unessential and feeling the pushing action of clinging and they run right into habitual tendency as it arises because it happens so fast before the birth of action. This is interesting, Q says, I can see it, but could, you, could this uh, be how anger situations work between people? Yes, it is. Now on a smaller or larger scale, this can make the difference between war and peace in an office or home or a relationship. So you let me give you a situation where having this knowledge really made a difference. So take a situation like a woman who works in an office. Now there was a new secretary, a secretary I knew the, knew the woman when this happened, who was seriously thinking about quitting her job because her boss was so verbally abusive about her weekly report each Monday morning. And not knowing any better, she would accept the blame for the situation entirely each week and nothing would ever change. But early Monday, her boss arrived and walked to her desk and picked up the weekly report that she composed on Friday. And upon reading it, he always turned red in the face, got upset and behaved unrationally towards her to address the problem. He was always angry, always displeased. And at the same time, every Monday, she would make the same assumption, incorrect assumption, that his anger was being directed at her only entirely, you know, and she was to blame and very personally for everything. Now the situation is that she feels bad. She gets a headache. She just wants to go home. She hates her job and drags herself through the morning, just trying to mentally get through her time. And the people don't want to be around her anymore in the office. She was beginning to withdraw from the people. Well, then someone suggested practicing meditation to calm her mind. So she found a monk at a nearby temple who taught her about dependent origination and how her mind works. She listened, she wrote it down, she reflected, and she began to meditate. The teacher shared with her what makes up a human being and how one experiences uh, the existence in this life. And they talked about how everything works inside her mind, and she listened again, and she began to observe more closely, um, more closely what was happening in life. He gave her some information to take with her while she was learning the meditation. She began to contemplate this and understand a little bit more. The guiding monastic explained to her how the sense doors work with the human body. She was learning dependent origination, basics. He then taught her an example of how contact happens for these sense doors. With contact as condition, a feeling arises, felt as painful, pleasant, or neutral. With feeling as condition, craving arises, with tighter tension in the mind. He taught her how to detect the I don't like it mind, and this is not yet an emotional reaction. This craving held inside her desire to change the truth of what was going on in her office. And whenever she thought about the situation, tension would grow and tighten in both the mind and body. Her discontentment grew, but she kept on practicing and she was still in her job. With craving as condition, clinging arises and runs the stories in the mind about why she disliked everything. She began, became fascinated and came back for more information and introspection. And the guide then explained to her how when clinging arises, habitual emotional tendencies arise. And this is the place where we can get caught repeating and repeating unwholesome reactions. This is where many of us are stuck, always behaving in the same unfriendly and creative ways. The teacher then demonstrated how a person unconsciously pulls out a familiar reaction and plays it out as a heated emotion within any event. The anger can arise, which can leave us feeling washed out, exhausted, sad, and we broke, because we broke a precept. And it can leave us 
with a slow, tired, and dull mind. Habitual tendency link is where these emotional reactions begin to push and to get out of us, and they can be upsetting for the mind. Habitual tendencies from past events live in your brain in the personal library and collect there based on your previous exposure and experiences in life. And this is where the heated reactions lie hidden and can turn into reactive behavior at any time. You can just pop. And the library can offer us unwholesome, uh, 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 offer us wholesome responses to, to uh, in truth, our interactions are no longer just happening in the here and now. Behavior is influenced by past reactions unconsciously pulled up to repeat again and again. Well, the heart of the matter is that it cancels out the possibility for new innovative thinking. And that's a job raise in work, you know, because the creative person is the one that usually gets the energy and uh, gets to get the raise. If we don't balance ourselves better, one needs to see what is essential in a situation and pause to form a constructive response instead of reacting, and this is the solution. So identifying the link is the first step in gaining knowledge about its operation. Absolutely, and to do that, will you try something for me? And you can identify the habitual behaviors, and he says, sure, I'll do it. Okay, so this is the experiment that you should take and you should work out for a week. And when we have the birth of action, so I guess I'm ask, asking you really, Next Wednesday, I'll tell you what happened to her in the office. <laughs> because next weekend, she has the birth of the reaction. But I want you to understand what's going to come out next week is something interesting. People say to me, well, you know, what good is this going to do if you teach me the, uh, you know, dependent origination, but I don't teach him or my parents or whoever, the other person in the relationship, what good can it be when you hear the end of this story? next week, you begin to understand it doesn't necessarily have to be that both people involved understand dependent origination. This is very, it's very important for you to grasp. Because the thing that people try to do is like, now I know how this works. Now I got to go home and I got to teach my mother how it works. Not necessarily. You could change the whole entire relationship if only you understood it. And this is what you have to understand. But we have to talk a little bit about what exactly happens to the person when they start applying this, okay? Okay, so at the end of the day, I would like you to spend just a little bit of time in a small log. You know, you can get these little notebooks, little ones. Get, a, get one of those little notebooks. What happened to you uh, that was negative in the past 24 hours, from the time you get up until you go to bed like that, okay? So you do it for about one or two weeks, you can do it. I remember we did it for a week and then we got online and every, we all talked about it. Write down what you personally remember about any interactions that uh, brought up lingering, concern, distress, sadness, uh, sloth and torpor, restlessness, anything like that from the hab habitual, uh, I'm sorry, the hindrances. And these are in instances where you felt the heat of your body and your mind start to rise up very fast. And you acted out after some disagreement about something at work or home. Did you have an, uh, have own emotions come up, your own emotions come up, while dealing with other people or dealing with your own self while driving home or, or something uh, difficult, doing something difficult or challenging that was happen happening. Or, uh, okay, you can include things that are about living with your family too. It doesn't have to be just work, okay? It can be the whole gambit of dealing with anybody. Now, now that you have, um, been alerted to the existence of the habitual emotional tendency link. You write down what you saw happening inside mind more than one time. So when you read through it, now, just write them down. My advice is just write them down, leave them alone. And then on Sunday, at the end of the week, then pick it up and read through it with a highlighter 
and highlight the pieces that were where you got irritated. Be honest in your descriptions when you write this. You've been alerted to the existence of this habitual tendency link. You write down what you saw happening inside your mind more than one time and you, you add it up and you look at it. And if you can identify the cause of it, it's okay. Uh, but the thing is, I want you to see the looping. And you look, you let, uh, let me look at what you find when you review the log and you come up with a little chart. I did this so many times. I said this so many times. I walked out so many times. I slapped my hand on the desk so many times, whatever it was, or stamped my foot or whatever. And um, you keep the log and then you report back. And when you, when you do this, you try to use the four step investigation in your mind. Let's use the four step investigation the Buddha presented within his Four Noble Truths. So what do I mean? What is this that just happened? <laughs> what is this? And uh, what was the cause of it? To my side of what was the cause of it. In me, what tripped me off? Take a look. What set off my anger? What did it uh, resemble from some time before? Take a peek at that. And um, when, what would the cessation of this look like instead if you didn't pop off, what would it look like instead? And then uh, what could you change to help get rid of this kind of reaction in yourself? What could you change? Once you identify the loop, some, a lot of people come and they say, okay, this is ridiculous. I, I did it so many times, one person told me. So many times it was easy for me to see. I wanted to go to the hardware store after I did your exercise and buy a padlock. <laughs> I wanted to hook it on my ear just to remind me to lock the door on the library. And I was gonna try and really stop and decide what I was gonna do. And I thought I never thought about that. <laughs> but he wanted to lock it up, lock the door in the library and close the library so that you stop the looping. First, you have to be able to know it exists. Second, you've got to see it. You, it has a, it's affecting you by doing this exercise. The next thing you have, you can see the basis for a twim, can't you? Because the twim is the going like this before you pop. And so as soon as you feel this arising, as you're practicing twim, you're getting lower in the tension. So when something starts to arise, you can let it go here. But if somebody is practicing here and just letting it go and coming back and letting it go and coming back, letting it go and coming back, nothing's going down. So that person cannot feel the arising craving that's going to go into the clinging, that's going to go into this. You want to be able to sense it. So you start watching in your practice and you're going to see that you are beginning to sense it. A lot of you are doing automatic now. It's wonderful. So this is the end of the personal experiment. Uh, what could you change to get rid of this kind of reaction? What would be the cessation of this look like? It would be no looping. It would be fresh thinking. It would be innovative. We say peaceful, creative solutions in everything. Game, make a game of it. Have fun with it. Why get in somebody's face if they even make you mad? Because why? Somebody should scream, Anicca. <laughs> Some of one of you should scream, Ani because of Anicca. If you know Anicca is real as a law in the universe, why would you get so upset about that? You just, you know, okay, fine. <laughs> for five minutes, for three minutes, for five minutes, okay. But it's, it's going to end. And when it stops, then you move out of it and you smile and start using metta while it's happening. You can use forgiveness while it's happening, okay? Is that it? Well, that's it for now, Q. <laughs> this is enough for you to work with. Now we have to move on to the next link to see what happens to the lady in the office when her boss, is, when her boss triggers uh, his own clinging and his habitual tendencies. He's looping on Monday morning. I want to find out what she does. And what she does is wonderful. It's just wonderful. So we're going to do that one next time. So this is all we're going to do here. And um, I'm going to ask you guys, do you have any questions about Bawa? Anybody have any questions about it? 
I can't believe it was that good of a teacher. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Maybe he, he was the good teacher right there, my shoulder. <laughs> um, I just really like this tree. I don't know how you feel about it, but I like the tree. I want to stick my head in the tree. <laughs> you know, and just be at the base of the tree. So I hope everybody is doing really good. And um, I don't know if you have any trouble with stuff. I will tell you something like I, I found that the, um, uh, the use of the loving kindness and the, uh, the compassion and the joy and the equanimity, because it serves as a way of systematically train, train, training your mind. To, to know that you are washing away Ill, the ill will thoughts with the first part of your practice. And then the compounds, the second part of the practice, and that's those ill will thoughts are not kind of, then cruelty is going away. Okay, the cruelty is going away. And then with the joy, what's happening is discontent is going away. And then the last, at the end of it, you feel a letting go of any aversion to anything. And if you do get to go, you know, if you do get to go through once and you come out, you're like fresh like a child. It's so, it's so open and uh, it's so clear in your mind and your mind is, uh, there's a big space in it now because you have experienced how what we're trying to tell you is real. And by finding out it's real, it's very special because it makes it for you, for the average person to use it all the time. Um, the, the, we need to stop with divisions. We need to stop with groups. We need to come back. This is, this is my opinion about the Buddha Dhamma and say the Buddha Dhamma was something that was taught for humanity and not be people that are pushing all the time to get Buddhists, more Buddhists, we need more Buddhists. Actually, we need the world to use Buddhism, but I frankly, I can't tell you that I'm, like I don't work very well as an ambassador for the United States sometimes, <laughs> and I, I don't work really good as somebody who's gonna proselytize in Buddhism because I don't think that's necessary. I think it's something that will just spread out if people understand more about how it's for everybody to use within any way that you live your life. It's just making things easier for you. And the relief that you get from learning how to um, let go, relax, smile, come back. Now, the thing about anger, I was gonna say this because I, I realized I didn't put it into what I wrote just now. But in the case of anger, I, the thing about anger is, I guess it's in that next one, it's in that next segment. Uh, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. If you have a problem with anybody being angry with you, at some point you need to learn to just laugh. And I mean, just laugh. This is, this is not peace. And then go get coffee or go get a donut or go get a jelly, something packed with jelly. <laughs> have something sweet or have coffee or tea together and just sit there and just listen to each other. Take turns listening to each other. Because if you get to a point where you cannot agree on a topic. Who cares? <laughs> Is the idea, you know, make it, tell the other person, you know, I'm gonna go work for a think tank now. And they'll say, what's a think tank? A think tank is where you can think about anything you want and nobody's gonna criticize you. And you can sit there and just talk off your head about it and nobody's gonna say you're politically incorrect or anything while you're just doing this brain, uh, brain searching process, this brain searching thing, nobody's gonna pounce on you. And to have someone in the world where you can just take turns doing that is a wonderful thing. Because then it's, when I say something, I was talking to somebody the other day about a particular point in Buddhism. And when they wrote me back, they said, well, so that's your point of view. And the point was, 
I don't have points of view. <laughs> I don't have points of view. I'm constantly looking to see if there's an easier way to get it across. And if I say something to you and you don't get it or you really disagree with it, come back to me and tell me. Because what I want to know is, did I not explain it right? And when I cross over into Bangladesh and explain it or Thailand and explain it, I'm going to have to adjust it again. You see, if I'm in a different country, because people hear things different ways. And so this is really interesting. And it's, it's like I said, it's so, it's so fractionalized now. The only way to make it unified is to come back and say, well, it, it is a fundamental thing, but it's not a bad kind of fundamentalism. It's a fun kind of fundamentalism because you're going back to the text, to what the Buddha said, and then what you're going to do is you're going to see it. You're going to accept that those results are basically described well. That's what we decided about the Majjhima Nikaya, okay? So we have to, then we decide we have to find the smoothest route in practice where those things actually do happen as the result. You see? That's better than saying, I've been practicing and I have these results, so I'm going to translate it so it matches my results. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> you know, that wasn't a, a good avenue to do it that way. That was just your personal thing, and I'm proud of you, and I'm glad you were able to do that, but that isn't exactly fair. Any more than me try, I tried initially the same way as when I teach somebody how to teach, they're going to do it. They're going to go out and try and teach it in terms of what exactly happened to them. And they will do that until they have 30 people in the room one time or 40 people. And then when they go through those interviews in a day, they're going to find out. They all heard you say the same talk the night before. And now listen to what's coming back to you in the interviews, how differently people heard that. You see? And so trying to sort it out in communication is a very interesting thing. And trying to make it as simple as possible. So anything that we've ever printed, any books we've printed, this is absolutely true for Damasuka. We used to print it in the front. I forget what it was. Everybody said, you need a copyright. If you, if you publish, you have to have a copyright. So what should we say? So we said something to the effect of, this is copyrighted and it's right to copy this as long as you don't change the meaning of it. And you can check with us if you want to get permission. That was our copyright statement. <laughs> that's what we did because we wanted to let it go as far as it could. If you felt the urge to try and say it, if you wanted to run it by us, it would be polite. And when I say be polite, what do I mean? Uh, well, Bonte printed a book in 1995. And it was the Anapanasati Sutta, a guide to breathing meditation. Okay. And um, this, this little book was 90 pages. That's it. 90 pages. T -t -t, you know, so first time I decided to track this book, and he did it in 1995. I started with him in 2000. Okay. And um, the reason I decided I wanted to trace it, see how much I could research, how many copies actually existed of this, you see, was because somebody was trekking in the Himalayas and they went into a tiny temple way up in the Himalaya mountains in Nepal. And inside those temples are little tiny libraries in little co alcoves with books. And he went in there and he found this book in, in Himalay, in, in, in Nepal. And somebody had put it into that library, you see? So this is what triggered the whole thing was because I was teaching him that summer and he kept referring to the book. I, Where did you see that book? Have you been away this long? No, I found it inside the library in a tiny little temple way up in the Himalaya mountains. So I'm thinking, where did this book really go? So I started tracking it the first year I got to 200,000 copies. The second year, over 500,000. The fifth year when I did it, it was over a, mil I, a million copies. I stopped. What had happened was he printed this book 
and originally put his name that he was ordained, U Vimala Ramsey. U means Bhante. The U means Bhante in Burma. So U Vimala Ramsey. Oh, you know, this is a big shot Asian monk, everybody thought. And so nobody knew where U Vimala Ramsey was, and Bhante Vimala Ramsey was in the United States, but nobody put two and two together. We weren't anybody at, at that time, nobody really knew about us. And another thing that triggered the research was uh, when I went to look at Amazon uh, to see if anyone was selling this book, because uh, we were we would give it away until we ran out of copies. And then um, there were three people who were selling this book on Amazon out of New York City. And um, they would go to a big monastery where they gave away books, piles of books, you see. With, and they would go up there with a carpet bag and sweep them off the table into a carpet bag and go home. That's called raw material. <laughs> and then they would sell them to survive. They would sell them on the internet. And this book was selling for $19.95, $36.95, and $60. This tiny little book. So you could order it through Amazon. So I bought three copies and called the people to ask him if they knew where the author was. <laughs> they just wanted to know if they knew where the author was. And how, how did, they, oh, that's somebody who's passed away. He's some Burmese monk. You see, they thought he was, so I went down to Bonte's cootie and knocked on the door, you know, knocked on the door. He came to the, to the screen. He says, so what's up? <laughs> and I said, you're dead. <laughs> He said, I'm dead. I said, no, seriously, you are dead. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I, this year, it's like about 500,000 copies. And two things happened. I found out these people are selling your book for $60, $70 a book and on Amazon for used books, you see. Uh, but you didn't even know anything about it. So then uh, the group in New Jersey told me that um, they, it's mandatory there are people read it. Um, they didn't like the introduction, but everybody's required to read the book. It was very funny. Uh, but um, he, they did 3,000 or 5,000 copies, I think it was. And the most interesting was Oxford uh, School of Religion in England, who actually printed 25,000 copies of this book to teach breathing meditation in in Oxford. And I was like, they never bothered to communicate with anybody. It had it had a um, it had a what do you call the number in the front? It had the number in the front of the book, you know, but they didn't bother to track it. They just pre-printed it, put it in a different. So I started collecting the different covers, different colors, and different de decorations, and put them up in the library. And then that's what we do. We keep the copies of everybody up there. And like I said. Who knows what it did? Because then we just, someone said, well, you should stop them from selling it. I said, why? We don't want to pay an attorney to stop them from selling this book when the, our main objective is to get as many people to learn about this as possible. So if you want to pay that much for a book, I mean, I met a woman once who went to Palm Springs to a bookstore, Palm Springs, and paid $400 for this book, $400 for a Majima Nikaya hardbound book. And the woman presented it to her with the price tag on it. I saw the price tag on the book in the front inside when I was out at her uh, meditation retreat center. Who gave me that book? Some woman went over to Palm Springs. Who can explain people that have a lot of money? Nobody really can explain them sometimes, but they obviously think the book's not reading unless you pay a certain amount of money for the book. I don't get it, you know, but that, that's the kind of stuff. And then what happened was from there, we started uh, translating was a funny thing. We did not ask anybody to translate for the first uh, seven years, six years. I was working, building in the center and working with it six or seven years, we did not ask anybody. They just said, would contact me and say, I would like to translate this, is it okay? And when you go there now, there's probably 15 languages altogether, I think. And so not everything is translated that we write in that language. And um, because people wanna volunteer, for instance, in Norway, 
the man came to America, took a retreat, and learned to practice the metta, and wanted to teach his mother, but she wanted to learn, but she wanted the book to follow. So he translated the book. <laughs> That's how come you have a Norwegian translation of the, uh, the Brahma Vihara. So it, this is as crazy as how it all works. When you don't have one penny to advertise, you don't have one penny to print and everything, and then it all kind of works. It's just very interesting. So any questions about anything in your practice? Deepa, mm -hmm. Deepa? Yes, uh, sister, I had a, um, when I first uh, heard Bhante talk about how breaking a precept leads to hindrance arising, uh, it, it felt very intuitive, like it was an aha moment that happened. Is there anywhere in the text that it mentions that this is how, did Buddha talk about it? Oh, goodness, yes. Yeah. Um, you have to kind of put two, you have to go a lot of places to pull it together. It's not like in one spot. I don't think it is. I might, I have to think about that deeper, whether I actually know if there's a sutta which is going tit for tat. And probably, well, yeah, because there are sets of, there are suttas where the, where the um, precepts are mentioned and his pattern of teaching was to explain the suffering. So he's always showing you in the first paragraph what not to do, okay? And that's where you're gonna be miserable and it's impossible to get to Nibbana and everything's gonna go wrong. That's where all your hindrances live, okay? So then he's gonna show you what to do and the solution is keeping your precepts. So that's how you get to this point where you're saying it's, it's that way. I have to look around to see if I can find the ones that are, um, I suppose anyone, do, do you have them, Majima Nikaya? Do you have it? Yes. No? You do, yeah. all right, you, okay, go into the, write it down, go, go into the index and you'll love this. Um, it, you won't find anything under precepts. You got to go to virtue, the old word virtue. They spent almost an hour one time trying to find the precepts in the index. Couldn't believe it wasn't in there anywhere. <laughs> I was like looking for being good and behaving myself, all kinds of things. And then it turns out it was virtue. So under virtue is where the listing is. You go through the text one by one. If you find in the text at the beginning, there's always going to be, how was this sutta set up? Okay. And who, who are they talking to? Where are they located? And you can figure out how old the Buddha is from that sometimes. And then you say, this is where they are, and this is who they're talking to, and they're talking about this point. That's the suffering. And then the cause of the suffering, and then the Buddha is going to start talking. And the Buddha is going to give you a solution, and the first thing he's going to do is tell you how it won't work. And then he's going to tell you how it will work. So if you want to see that pattern, if you were to go to 148, you can see that pattern. All right, just off the cuff, I mean, off the top of my head. If you went to 148, that's exactly how it's set up, okay? Um, so when you're getting it to the abandonment of the underlying tendencies, the underlying tendencies come first. And that makes it, if their tendencies are still there, you can't get to Nibbana, but if the underlying abandonment of the underlying tendencies, then you get to go to Nibbana. It is possible. So that's how they're constructed. So in this case, let's see if we can try it real fast. We go to virtue in the text, in the, in the, the um, right, virtue. Okay, and then let's go to, um, let's try 7811. Let's see if that's one of them, 7811. 78, 11. So in this sutta, yeah, this is a very good example. So listen, in this sutta, this is the Samana Mandika Sutta. If we look at this, did I tell myself what it was in the front? Um, not really, but that's all right. Just listen. Um, the, what's coming first is section 10. What are the unwholesome habits? They are unwholesome bodily actions, unwholesome verbal actions, and evil livelihood. 
These are called the unwholesome habits. And what do these unwholesome habits originate from? They originate from the mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied in different aspects, there is a mind affected by lust and hatred and delusion. And unwholesome habits originate from this. Whenever it says delusion, that means you're taking things too personally. Personal view, personal, uh, per, per, personal perspective of things, okay? And where do the unwholesome habits cease without remainder? The cessation is stated here. Uh, the student abandons bodily misconduct. They develops good bodily conduct. He abandons verbal uh, misconduct and develops good verbal conduct. So here comes the correction, you see? And then he abandons mental disconduct and um, develops good mental conduct. He abandons wrong livelihood and he, he gains uh, living with right livelihood, okay? So there you are. Now, this, this is good because I, I was gonna teach this one. Which one is it? Okay, it's not for next week, but I'm gonna teach you 64 shortly. But this one, I don't know if you've heard before or not. So now after he told you what's a bad deal and what's a good deal, right? Now he's gonna tell you how to get to the good deal. This is his pattern of doing things. So how practicing, does he practice the way to the cessation of these unwholesome habits? And here it comes your practice. Are you ready? The, bhikkhu, the, the, the student will awaken enthusiasm for the non-arising of any unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. And he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. It means he practices by following the instructions, okay? And he does that, he does that with enthusiasm. That's the first step of your, your practice. And then he awakens the enthusiasm for the abandoning, the release. See, he recognizes it and he, he, he recognizes them and steers clear of them. But when they come up, he then abandons the un, arisen evil and wholesome state. And then he does practices the same way again in earnest. And then he awakens the new arising of unarisen wholesome states. That's your smile coming back up, okay? He awakens enthusiasm for the continuance, the non-disappearance and the strengthening and increase and fulfillment by development of more arisen wholesome states. That's just your whole personality, Deepa, you keep going. <laughs> You keep smiling, you keep letting go and relaxing and smiling and coming back. So there you are, right, in that paragraph. So then over here, it says, what are the wholesome habits? Then he goes on and he said, what, which one was that? Wait a second, just a second. 70, okay, at 11, he gets very particular um, because it's going to go into the virtue. So let's read section 11. What are the wholesome habits? They are wholesome bodily actions, wholesome verbal actions, and purification of lifestyle. They are called the wholesome habits. And what do these wholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated they should be said to originate from the mind. Mind, command center. Mind is the forerunner. All right. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied, and of different aspects, the mind is unaffected by lust and hatred or delusion. So what is the opposite of lust and hate delusion is metta karuna mudita upeka. So we're touching, we're getting down to brass tacks here. Bhante has refined it to this is the question, this is the answer, so what does it mean? It means this practice, okay? Then, and uh, you're just washing the brain, washing the brain till you flip to the uh, automatic the way you've done, okay? And where do these wholesome habits cease without remainder? These, their cessation is stated, here a student is virtuous. That means they keep their sila, okay? And he does not identify with his virtue, uh, and he understands as it actually is that deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom where these, um, these wholesome habits will cease without remainder. So everything ceases in the end, everything just before you, you black, the black part, blackout happens, everything just disappears when the conditions are right. How practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of these wholesome habits? 
the student, and it repeats the six R's again. It repeats it again. So on one page, you have it at the top of the page, you have it again at the bottom of the page. The whole entire thing is, is once again. So the student um, will practice the way to the cessation of the wholesome, uh, of the wholesome habits and he'll uh, awaken enthusiasm. Now this is like what he's talking about when he says let go of the wholesome habits. He's talking, okay, what's he talking about? He's really talking about when you get to nothingness and you get into where mind is the uh, object of meditation. You're letting go of absolutely everything that comes up. The beautiful dog you love at home, the baby that's sleeping, you're gonna go hug. Everything, you just let everything, you see, go. Because you want to completely clear the slate and see where can the mind go? How far can it go? So here the student awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen wholesome states for the continuance and the non-disappearance and strengthening the increase and the fulfillment by the development of arisen wholesome states he makes an effort, arouses his energy, keeps his energy up in his body, exerts his mind by practicing the six R's and his observation, his mindfulness as observation. And he strives, but strives isn't a bad work here. We know the tone and the level of striving we're talking about, you see. And one uh, so practicing practices the way to the cessation of the wholesome habits. And that's one. And then it talks about unwholesome intentions and wholesome intentions. So every time it talks about mentions the word virtue, it's going to keynote it. That's where the, the reference is for the sila. But when the, there are also ones in here, mm, um, trying to think of a good one. I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you Saturday. You're going to come Saturday? Listen Saturday? Okay. I'll find it for you. I'm going to write it down. Find the um, find the um, the sutta because there's I know I've read some I can't pinpoint it in my mind but I've read a sutta where it tells me uh, the the precepts and then it explains exactly why in detail and then it tells me if I don't doing the opposite you see what happens and a lot of it has to do with what's happening in the next life or after after death the rebirth process what's what you going to end up with it has to do with that too yeah so okay you don't want to fall into depredation fall into perdition and even into hell <laughs> you don't want to be there you know and you, you want to go the other way <laughs> okay if you have to stick around i mean if you're determined to stick around and come around and come around and some people don't get it, you know, why should I stop, you know, well, that the whole thing, I like to listen to Bhante, sometimes you hear him explain it at the end, just imagine you never get angry again, at, annoyed, annoyed, irritated, and you just stay clear, and you can sit, my goodness, you can sit for hours, and there's just nothing that crosses your mind, nothing. And then you wonder if you're alive, <laughs> alive. <laughs> you, know, you know, and I used this one girl, she said, I said, why can't you lose your body? She said, why should I lose my body? I said, uh, and then I caught her sitting there with her eyes closed, sitting, and then all of a sudden, this is like an hour and a half into it, I'm in the room watching everybody, and I see her going with her fingers like this, pinching her thigh, <laughs> poking herself to be sure. She said, I had to be sure. I was still there. And I'd say, well, that's good progress. That's very good progress. You're really starting to let go of everything. You have any other questions? Anybody? Hmm? You okay. were talking. Hello. I'm sorry? Uh, yes, no, no, no. You were talking about um, the, um, how uh, certain, you know, tendencies disappear on people when they did not know they were there. You know what I mean? Like they, like suddenly, like the person who, who has this sudden fear of falling from, from a, um, you know, a staircase oh, or something like that. Oh, falling from a ladder, uh, a ladder or something, yeah, you mean? Yeah, exactly. A sudden phobia. Phobias, and, yeah. Yeah, and what about it? No, no, I was just thinking about how, how um, um, this is, you know, that something that we don't know why we have the tendency to do certain things or to, to be fearful of certain things. 
uh, because rationally speaking, you know, in this life, there was nothing that may have triggered that. That's, yeah. that's and then you were well, talking a little bit about- That was the mysterious thing. I'm, I'll tell you the truth. I'm the one that had the shock of my life at 51, climbing up with a big spoon, a great big spoon to clean out the, um, the rain gutter on the roof. And he sent me up the ladder in the kitchen part of the building where the kitchen was, the old kitchen. And I got up and it's almost a flat roof. It's just like this. It's not like that. It's just like this. And the rain gutter is down here. And I, when I went to stand up, I never had anything like this happen. And it was the, um, it was only six or seven months since I had left Florida. And when I was in Florida, I was doing absolutely crazy things before I went out to the, to the mountain. I just made a conscious decision. I was going to do everything I wanted to do before I, before I went out there and didn't do anything more. <laughs> so um, when I say that, I was water skiing again, and I was bike riding 250 miles, and I was rollerblading 75 miles, and I was, uh, you know, jumping out an airplane because I thought I'd never do it again. So I was jumping out and uh, jumping out of an airplane once with a parachute, and and then I the other thing I I, I did was uh, I really wanted oh I also kite sailed you know where you're you're on like a small surfboard, you pop it up and then you put your, flip your kite up and you can kite, if the wind pulls you on the surfboard, it's really fun. I did that and I didn't break my legs, I was fine. <laughs> you know, and then um, I went out to the center and I had been flying small planes and these were like ultralight planes. The kind that you tighten 128 screws before you get in the plane and go up. <laughs> you go up like uh, to 700 to 1,000 feet and fly along the coastline in Miami and South Miami. So that's what I was doing. And then all of a sudden I go out to the center and not even three months later, uh, initially when I got there, I could climb the fire tower, which was three stories like high. And it had five staircases to go up to the top. And then when this happened, when I got off the roof, I said, I don't know what to do. And he said, let's see how bad it is. I don't think it's really that bad. I said, no, Bonte, it's really bad. How am I going to do all this work in the woods now? How am I going to trim these trees, all this other stuff? He said, let's just go to the fire tower and, and climb up. So he drove up to the fire tower and I could only go up one staircase. My heart went up to like 74 or something, 75. And, and, and I was just like panting. I thought I was gonna pass out. My legs were like jelly and it took two, a couple people helped me get down the stairs. So we went on this whole adventure. Uh, when, he, when we went to Florida that year, we drove down to the University of Florida to do some teaching things. And when we were down there, um, you know, I got, um, he, just, he said, you've got to get to this point before I won't, I can't help you. So I got to the point he wanted me to get to in the meditation. And then he said, I'm willing to show you how to, to roll time backwards. And I said, okay, fine. I wasn't really interested in this. This is, and he said, that's why I'm going to teach you <laughs> because they don't want you to you know, I don't tell people I'm going to teach them. I won't teach them. I've learned lessons about that because people will tell you they're not have any reason to do it. And then all of a sudden they'll try to sell it to somebody else or something and they don't know what they're doing. Anyway, we did it and it was pretty easy. Lasted three days, about three or four days long. Went through four or five different lifetimes the way I told you. And what I found in those four or five lifetimes um, I wasn't really in there to find out the person's name, the name of the town, the people they were with, what they ate, all the stuff that's described in the text. I wasn't there for that. I was trying to see what would happen if a person showed up in front of me and they were the, nearly the same age as me. And um, if I want, they say that if you do this, and this is what happened, I arrived to check this person out on the day they're gonna die. So I get to see them fall off a house and fall off a wall and things. There's nothing I can do about it, but I'm from a place where I can see what's happening. And when you find out how old the person was, it's a shock because they're the same age as you. And it's this information is turning up. The alignment of this is crazy. 
But what happened to me was it flipped my mind into understanding absolutely clearly that this life has nothing to do at all with the other life. Nothing to do with that other life. This has got to be the disconnect you pick up with this. I'm not into, um, uh, what do you call it? Oh, you know, um, I lost my terminology. Connection therapy? No, the Dalai Lama is reincarnated. I'm not into reincarnation. Uh, reincarnation does occur, but it's extremely rarely a not systematic thing that happens with human beings. It's just not. But rebirth is different. Rebirth is different. And what this is about is in rebirth, when a person dies, if you're beside them, if they die on the bed, and you can stay there for a half hour and put your hand just behind their head like this and cup it, and you're allowed to stay with the body, you can feel everything, leave the heat, leave the body and go to the center of the body and go up the body and leave through the crown of the head. That's how it happens. What is it? Nobody knows. Okay. But a lot of people will say, that's your consciousness leaving, leaving. Okay. And when it leaves, where's it go? It goes into the universal consciousness is the easiest way to explain it to you. A floating around, you know, universal consciousness that draws that consciousness into a baby before the baby's born. It, as the baby's growing in the mother grows goes in so if you've had a baby you understand what i'm talking about in 11 weeks there is this like little flutter thing that's called the butterflies at 11 weeks you can feel this happening and you know there's something inside you and that's when it occurs and a lot of people like to play the game of saying that the fetus takes the consciousness at the time of formation and i don't buy it at all and i don't uh, because I've talked to too many people uh, about this, where they've had these kinds of experiences to get rid of phobias and stuff, and they're talking the same way they've had children too in women's groups, and I, they they don't talk about any type of identification at all, except you can say that it's there, okay, like that. But it, whether and they can't say what's really going on with this, a fetus that's bigger than, you know, like my baby finger type thing. See what I mean? But at 11 or 12 weeks, all of a sudden something happens. You see, the real teeny one before that, mm, I don't buy that. I, I can't, it's just me, <laughs> you know? Um, but it was a truly amazing thing because as soon as I accepted that this was all something that happened to these other women at 51 or 52 years old, and they all died the same way they all fell. It was gone. It was like, why am I concerned about this fear? And the rest of that year is a whole other story about what, it, what happened in my practice and stuff. Because at the end of the year, by then it was like, oh, and you want to send me to see the president or send me to see God? I don't care you send me to see it. It's fine. I'm not afraid of anything. And I used to be concerned about going to see. I never was afraid of audiences. I loved that. But um, whether it was 10 people or 5,000, never disturbed me at all. But going in to talk to a senator about human rights would get to me sometimes, <laughs> you know, or talking to a legislature about an issue for mental health and mobility issues for people that would, I used to get pretty, I used to have to play a role to myself, you know, to, to protect myself from showing how shook up I was about it. And then all of that just left. It's inconsequential once you realize that the only time you're alive is right now, this right here. And they can say this moment, this, this uh, present moment, and it is true, but it is at the same time a cliche, because how many of you can stay in a present moment? No one. So it's a cliche. It's a gimmick to get you to read the book. Come and let me show you how to stay in the present moment. I can teach you how to play, stay in the present time, can I? And you did that. And, that, and that's something of staying in the task you are in and from the beginning to the end. Or you're playing a song on a guitar from the beginning to the end. Yes, you can do that. Yes, you can do um, you know, something with direct conducting with music. You can do this kind of stuff or any number of different things. 
but pre you know, nanosecond, <laughs> nanosecond. <laughs> it's kind of far out there. So anybody else have any questions? That was just the story about what happened. And when I did, okay, so he did this and then we went back up to the, to the center and then he gave me back the spoon and he said, go up and clean the thing again. And I went up and cleaned the roof at the get, because nobody else had cleaned it. I cleaned it out. And then what happened was he said, get in the truck now, let's go up to the fire, uh, the fire tower. We went up and I just went all the way to the top of the fire tower and just went, woo! <laughs> And then I have a picture of that somewhere when I went to the top of the fire tower and then uh, I just went downstairs and we drove back down to the center. We were only a, a couple miles, maybe three miles or maybe five miles from that place, you know, where the tower was. So getting, and I also experimented with a woman who couldn't swim and um, she was really terrified of water to an overextent. She had four children and in the river, the people would come to swim in the river near the base of the mountain. And her problem was she was really terrified of sitting in a small chair in the water with her feet in the water, but on a chair, just for afraid of water period. And I experimented with teaching her enough that she wasn't afraid anymore of the water. And the same thing happened to her because it was a phobia, she saw that she had drowned before. And once she saw that she had drowned before, it's all fun, it's all fun. It's a matter of a mixed up disconnect in your brain and finding, getting to the place where you see the truth of it. And um, that's it, frees you from it. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Yeah. Hi, sister. Yes, mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. How to how to maintain a consistency consistency in any task every day everyday life. Did you hear me? Well, yeah, I do. Okay. If you are you practicing twim? You're practicing twim? Yes. Yes. You're, you are. Okay. Yes. So you, you look at your practice and the whole thing is about when we talk to you about after a retreat, how do you go back into life with this? You transfer taking the smile that's uplifting you and put it into anything that you're doing. Now, I'm a farm girl, sort of, mostly living on farms when I grew up. So it's your turn to go out and clean out the stalls with the horses and the goats and clean the chicken coop. And who wants to do that? But it's a big so what? Why? Because what you're learning from the Buddha is everything has, is not there, and then it has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. So you're, you're having the only uh, example, I, uh, the example I'll give you is someone was at our center and really needed money before he went home and flew home. And um, there were no more jobs left down at the bottom of the mountain except to clean the bathrooms at the camp center. <laughs> you know, and and he just went, okay, this is the big test. I'm going to clean the bathrooms for all these people who were drinking beer and camping at the bottom of the mountain. He's going to go in there and clean the bathrooms every morning and then come back up and wash himself off and work at the center too. And so we let him go down on his bike every day and we would say to him, how can you be so happy? And he said, because I'm practicing loving kindness. And when Bhante told us what to do in life and you're tired of doing your task or doing what you have to do or helping your mother in the house where you never had to help your mother. There's a big problem for men in India right now. They never had to help their wife before in the house. She had a maid, she had a cook. And now all of a sudden in lockdown, they have to do everything. And some of you have older mothers and you should be taking the position of so what? And we're going to do it and it just decide to do it from the beginning through the middle through the end and you know there's an end and how do you know because of anicca everything that arises passes away so the buddha gave you this this system he told you first of all with your sense doors anything you see is sight is just a sight a sound is just a sound and what you smell, odor is just an odor, just what it is. Essentially, that's all it is, is just an impersonal, 
function of your body. Okay, so somebody expels gas a lot when they walk. Well, that's just what they do. And it, you know, that's, that's all that happens. And somebody else, you say, well, I taste things, you know, and, and you have to eat something that doesn't taste good, but it's the only food that's there. You just do it and get it over with. Because why? And you smile at it, you forgive it, you send loving kindness into it when you're mopping, when you're sweeping, when you're washing, when you're scrubbing, when you have to change the beds, the kids, the, the everything that you have to do in the house. You're doing it all the time. So you just do it because why? Because you know there's an end and it's much easier to do a task when you know there's a beginning, a middle and an end. That's gotta be a cool lesson. And when you know you have a Nietzsche is not a suggestion. And Nietzsche is a law. It is, an, it is a, um, a universal law that we cannot get away from. There is nothing in the whole entire world that is permanent. Everything arises, is there, and passes away. So you can, you've got a choice. You definitely have a choice. And this is from this teacher I used to have before I had Bonte. And the first lessons they sent me in the mail said, we have a choice in life. Whenever something happens, we can laugh or we can cry. <laughs> that was all she gave us was that choice. She didn't give us much other information. But boy, she described what happens to you if you cry about it and fret about it and stress yourself out and your heart goes up and your stomach hurts and you can't sleep and you don't want to eat and you're grouchy with everybody complaining about it and occupying your mind. Nobody wants to be around you. That's that side. And the other guy is pushing the broom, laughing, flips it up and dances with it a few times and puts it down and scrubs the floor and is laughing and getting the job done, whether it's cleaning cars, whether it's cleaning out a building nobody uses and all this stuff is left in and you say, well, these people have no shelter, but we're going to clean this out and let them have shelter in this barn. And everybody does it. Nobody wants to, but they do. So you do and you get it done. See, we're very spoiled in the world right now. Um, and um, I sometimes think because we have five blackouts a day here <laughs> where I am, you know, they're testing us, you know, just to see. I guess they figure if I have five blackouts every day here and have to keep turning the, you know, the internet back on and stuff, I won't get upset if it's blacked out for a week or something. I'll be used to it. And I'll just say, well, eventually it will come back on. You see? So all of this is, what is this I'm telling you about? I'm telling you about you have a choice in your perspective of how you're going to look at things. Okay. You perceive there's a problem and you, you, you see the problem. Now, once you've seen it, that's fine. But now how are you going to look at how you're doing it? You have a choice about that. The perception part of it, the perceiving of what hap is happening in front of you, perceiving the event, that's part of the human body. You do not command your perception. You know, you perceive it one way and Ulysses perceives it another way and Deepa perceives it in another way and you stood on the corner and all three of you watched a car accident happen and you perceived it a different way and that is what drives judges crazy. They won't let us talk about it in the United States. They will not talk in traffic court about that anymore because there was an accident. And then if they let you guys get involved, you were here and somebody was here and somebody was here and then they have a lot more to deal with. So they just decided, well, we're going to cut that out and the police are going to come and draw the diagram and we're just go to court and that's it. That's all. <laughs> and try to settle it that way. And you guys are unique over here because if anything happens to a bike, no matter what, even if the bike caused the accident, it's your fault. That's what they did in Asia. They just said, that's it. <laughs> I heard about that in... Indonesian, I just sat there and laughed and thought about the impact of that because I have been through sitting through traffic courts sometimes with friends and listening to everybody fight about that. And then in Indonesia, I think it was Ardika or somebody told me, no, no, they went over here. The bike is law. Even if grandma can't ride the bike the right way, even if she caused the accident, it's the other guy's fault. It's crazy, but it seems to work. It seems to make everybody be pretty careful. Yeah.
So I hope that answered your question okay. Anybody else? How you doing, Ardika? Are you okay? I'm very you okay? good. Okay, <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay, I think we cut time here, right? Are we okay with time? <laughs> it's uh, two hours, <laughs> almost two hours. <laughs> You were I was looking at it. No, wait a minute. Oh, really? Oh, 30, 19. No, 19, 30, 20, 30 would be 20, 30. Wait a minute. Nine, is it 6, 30. 6, 30. You started at 6, 30. 7, 30, 8, 30. So that would be, um, what? 17. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> you know what, RD? I'm going to start a show for 30 minutes a couple times a week. <laughs> you believe that i'm not sure what we're gonna do <laughs> so so you need to find all of you need to figure out ways to have fun with learning the dependent origination pieces and watching the dependent origination you know and watching it happen around you and you're gonna when you start if you keep doing it enough just clowning around when you're watching it you know whenever a feeling's arising this will be surprising. And whenever the feelings are rising, let it go, let it go, let it go. If you would just do that a little bit, you know, that you would all of a sudden, the brain would start, go, oh, look, there's dependent origination. <laughs> and it starts to just click and, and you get it. And all of a sudden, it's part of you. And that's what you have to do. You have to play with it. I mean, Sarah will tell you, you're not going to get the yoga right unless you keep doing it, you know? And so, you know, you have to do it over and over and over again. And then all of a sudden it becomes part of you. It was like my bike riding. I thought I'd never get it. And then, you know, one time I, I have just one couple minutes here I, for the two hour mark. <laughs> so, so one time I was riding bike with my trainer down in Florida and this whole thing happened on a bet. These men bought this bike for me to ride and they bought the clothes and the shoes and the hats and I mean, everything, the whole bike person thing, I was completely dressed up and I was much, much skinnier doing this. And they, he calls me and he says, his girlfriend and him are gonna go with some cat twos. There's like cat ones are like the people that did the, the, um, the French, you know, race and everything. And the cat twos are just below him. And I, I, I said, he said, you want to go? I said, I can't go with cat twos. You know, no, you come, you come, you come. Okay, so I decided I would go with them. So in Florida, everything's flat. You gotta understand everything's flat. And in other, when I was in Washington DC, the other guy that was teaching me, was coaching me, uh, we had hills. We had hills around that we could go up and down and stuff. But in Florida, you would have to go to, for instance, a bridge. And when the wind is blowing at a certain time of the day, you go to the bridge. And when you go up against the wind, that's a hill climb. <laughs> They're just bridges that go kind of like this. They're just really low bridges. But you would use a bridge for hill climbing and stuff. Anyway, long story short, we go out of our cars get on our bikes and there are about 21 people i want to say 21 people they're all doctors and lawyers and judges on these really expensive bikes you know and they start they do this thing spinning they call it spinning where you're you're pedaling really fast for three and a half miles three miles three to three and a half miles and then you start flipping into gears and you start going that's how it's done and the spinning we're all spinning and i'm fine and then they go into the first level of gears that's fine and they do a caterpillar and the caterpillar is like everybody thought they scream you know the line and everybody gets in the line and then you have one person behind this other person who's going to go backward but the, um, and what it is, is this one is the leader going like that. And then they go like this and they fall behind. And this one is the leader. So you do this thing where when this guy slips back to the end of the line and is still pedaling and keep, keeping up, it's a balancing act, right? And the first time I saw them do that, I, I had this gut feeling, I'm not going to make it, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to make it in this thing. So we're going 15 to 16 miles an hour steady. And this is going to go on like this for like, I don't know, an hour and a half at least, like that pace. And um, 
and then uh, I slipped a gear when we had, they talked about, they have these signals to slip into the gears. We get into the higher, and my gear slipped, and I just started going back. And they said, well, the rule was, they told us in the beginning, if you are in this group, you just get left behind, they just keep going. So I was, I was, so I thought, okay, I'll go climb Mount Trashmore. <laughs> and I knew about Mount Trashmore is where all the trash from Miami gets put, the solid waste management trash heap is as big as a mountain. It's the only mountain in Miami and South Miami. So I went and went up and down that thing like two times, puke, you know, it stinks. And then I drove back to my car. You know, so I called Tess the next morning and said, where are we gonna practice? And she says, no, I can't get up. I said, what happened? She said, right after you dropped out within the next half mile, you tell me there was not a David or an angel telling me to drop out in this story. I dropped out and there was a pile up. And what happened? Within 25 minutes after I, I dropped out, there was a massive pile. And what happened was we have this thing on these bikes. Try to picture this. The bike weighs less than eight pounds titanium. These bikes are really light. You can take the bike and lift it up and put it on your shoulder and take it up to the restaurant and put it beside your table and have lunch. They're just really crazy these bikes are so light you must always keep your seat this is like you must follow the rules if you're going to get to nibana listen to this you must stay on your seat as you're pedaling no matter how hard it is you cannot raise off the seat like you would on a normal bike and pedal to catch up and sit down again you cannot do it because you have to balance this tiny little thing that is only eight pounds and you're a hundred and some odd pounds well, his girlfriend, it was her turn to go in front. And when she came back, uh, she somehow that was involved. She, someone was off their seat and they were wiggling their, their um, handlebars. And her, she's up in the front when she goes to fall to the back along the side like this along the side. She catches the other person's handlebars near the front of the line. And they go down. And when they went down at 15 miles an hour in the front line, everybody went over them, over them. And these, this is the, the miracle of this story. <laughs> it never made the press. The ambulances went out. There were broken collarbones, broken collarbones here were broken. The shoulder bones were broken. She had tire marks across her back when I went to visit her in bed. And unbelievable damage for these people, even though they had these light, they were just piled body. It's like imagine a football team all on top of the guy who has the ball at the bottom. <laughs> she's at the bottom and she's like this tiny person. And um, I don't know how she survived it. All I know is there was an angel watching me and that's why I went to Mount Trashmore and I didn't, I wasn't involved in it. And the miracle of the whole thing was it didn't meet the press. The bike magazines never got a story about it and they never found out from the hospitals. A very hush hush. All these chief, uh, you know, um, x-ray people, doctors that read the x-rays and the CAT scans were involved in this bike group. And they were all, if you, he told me that it was over almost $200,000 worth of bikes there. Forget about the injuries and everything else. And these lawyers and doctors in that whole group, all of them were hurt, everybody. Some very seriously. So the point is, do not engage the hindrance. Follow the instructions. <laughs> when the hindrance comes, just go climb Mount Trashmore. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you know do not get involved in detours this stuff really works i don't know how to tell you it was such a nice retreat because i found enough uh, you know satisfaction in everybody's progress no matter what level they were working on but some of the there was a zoom zoomer and there was another person who really really did remarkably well from uh, another place another uh, part of the country and, and then someone who really realized what was holding them back. And all of this was like jewels. And you'll do that as long as you keep the instructions. So we have to go? Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So let's do this one. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free, and if you're struck, fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they all protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu.